Go ahead. Pretty much just what, how would you say today went? Oh, today went, in my, in my view, went extremely well. We had an appeal from Justice Russell's decision, which uh, granted the right to pursue the declaratory relief, constitutional relief, but had struck the, what they call, we call the tort or damages under the charter. So uh, the court today and the government had cross-appealed saying that the whole thing should have been struck like it was by Prothonotary Alto at the first level. And this court said they were dismissing the appeal and the cross-appeal, basically saying Justice Russell's decision uh, uh, survives and uh, is upheld, which is good news for the plaintiffs because it means that we could, e we, we could either re-amend to reinsert the tort claims or simply decide to pursue the declaratory relief and pursue, uh, pursue it from there. So I'll have to sit down with my clients and then they'll see what they want to do. You know? In either case, it has to go to the Supreme Court now? Not necessarily. I, I don't think that I would recommend to my clients that they seek leave to the Supreme Court because basically I consider this a win. Okay. Now the government may decide they want to seek leave to the Supreme Court. So we'll find that out in the next week. Most likely will do. Don't know. We'll find out in the next week or two. If they don't, then I re, I, I, I redraft the claim and just refile it. And now it's part of the end where you ask for the 60 days? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 60 days, so I'll redraft the claim and uh, uh, refile it, and then we go from there. Yeah. And when uh, the Crown argued about norms, like, what, what's the definition of norm in, like, well, in it's, law? It's, well, it's kind of weird. Uh, the Crown's submissions were, uh, were a bit lilting on that. I don't even want to comment because they were nonsense submission so I mean he was just le trying to lead the court astray not trying to lead the court astray but he basically wasn't on solid ground on what he was talking about all, yeah, the, all the, a lot of us felt yeah, yeah. all it means is that if something's justiciable you have to measure it against a norm but we have norms in the statement of claim against which we are saying it's justiciable constitutional violations the interpretation of the act those are norms that's what a court usually does that's what Justice Russell ruled that a court that's what they do from day to day. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, if you want to, you know how they talk about municipalities not being able to uh, get loans from the Bank of Canada? Uh, I think you should look at uh, Gerald nope. Grattan McGreer. No, I don't need to do that. Is. Well, it's a bit, I didn't, I didn't want to get into it. Historically, municipalities could, could directly get uh, interest free loans from the Bank of Canada. The act was amended because the provinces were complaining. Because municipalities are creatures of provincial statute, they saw the federal government's ability to directly send money to the municipalities as an intrusion into their jurisdiction. And so the provinces said, if municipalities want money, they ask us and we'll ask the bank. Now, that's changed because since then, the spending power by the federal government has been given full constitutional recognition by the courts so the governments theoretically could still, through their spending power, ask the bank for an interest-free loan and give it directly to the municipality. I didn't want to get into that kind of complicated nuance yeah, at, this at this stage because it's just a motion to strike. So, so he's he he uh, Peter was an old friend of mine. We article the year part of the Department of Justice didn't under didn't know that history doesn't understand that. So, but it was neither here nor there. Uh, see, the government always tries to just confuse the court and try to get them to just sweep everything under the carpet and make it go away. Uh, luckily for my clients, this, this court was alert to the issues. And, you know, uh, that's why I said, when I started my submissions, I said that I was taught in law school that both sides appeal. The decision is probably reasonable. And I think that's where they went. Yeah. And how would you define declaratory relief for those who might not understand what that means. Well, declaratory relief is one of the ancient writs that the courts have a right to issue, like habeas corpus or certiorari to quash or mandamus forcing the government to do. It's simply a declaration of right to declare either your rights personally or to declare the interpretation of a statute or common law power or executive action. So it's the court declaring the legality or illegality of either executive or uh, parliamentary action, whether it be cabinet regulations or conduct, ministerial conduct, or a statutory uh, 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 provision from parliament. So if it moves forward, then it'd be about trying to understand 
the statute, the statute in Section 189J That's right. the Bank of Act to That's see right. if May is a permissible. Right. So, so let's say, just for the sake of argument, let's say it moves forward and the plaintiffs are successful in saying that if a request is made or the government, if a reasonable request is made, they're, they're duty bound to make the request and the bank is, 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 is uh, duty bound to grant that request. Okay, then, so that's the declaration. So fast forward tomorrow, municipality requests and they say no. Well, that's subject to judicial review on the reasonableness or incorrectness standard. Do you understand? Yeah. So until you get there, they could just say no and nobody can say anything to, about it. Yeah, which okay. they have done. In 2001, Toronto. In, yeah, I understand. Indirectly, uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion with my clients about rekindling a request. So if we go back, we may just also take, take the decision to say no under judicial review as well. Okay. Or I mean, most of the claim is for declaratory relief. The damages are a minor part of the claim. So, and it would, it would reduce the court time if we forgot about the damages in terms of witnesses and everything. Yeah. How long do you think it would, like, something like this last? Well, it all depends on, you know, if it proceeds on the declaratory relief, we could probably get either agreement on certain facts or have a very short you know, either affidavit or trial on it. So, uh, and even if we went on that, there's still appeals of course. after that. So mm -hmm. I, th I think this, if it proceeds and it doesn't see another round of motion to strike, hopefully, ho hopefully, uh, this can be done in a couple of years, the whole thing. A couple of what? Years. It, it often takes more time to get over the strike issue than it does to actually do the proceeding. This is what I find frustrating about our system. Yeah. How many levels of appeal are there once we're past this? Well, there's only two levels of appeal. So you go to the federal court, there's a trial, yeah. and then court of appeal, this court, and yeah. then the Supreme Court. That's it. So that's it. And usually from the federal court system, from, from the judgment, you can get to the Supreme Court in under two years. How come it went so fast when it all came? Because they well, no, because they, they expedited that because of the, the urgency. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't get a ruling from the Supreme Court in under a year, no. <laughs> and so, no. Is that the first time you've had a case like that? That went so quickly to that level? Well, it's the first time there's ever been a case like that. <laughs> I mean, nobody's challenged the judge's appointment to the Supreme Court before, right? So, Great. yeah. yeah. And we're another, all, you had another case. Yeah, we lost. Melville. Yeah, we, no, we, lo we, we lost the reference on the Mainville reference in the Quebec Court of Appeal. We've appealed it, and the Supreme Court has expedited that hearing. We're going to get heard uh, April 23rd or 24th on that. That's also in under six months from the Court of Appeal reference. We argued December 2nd, and we've appealed it. Uh, it the judgment came down December 23rd. We've appealed it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's already imposed a schedule that's going to be heard in April. And what does that one mean? Well, that was an on round two, really. Because in on they said you have to be a Superior Court judge of Quebec to be appointed to the Supreme Court from Quebec. Yeah. So they appointed a Federal Court of Appeal judge from the same short list as on to the Quebec Court of Appeal, I think, with the intention of five months later when, when, when uh, Justice LaBelle retired last November to putting him up at the Supreme Court. We challenged that in federal court, and, then, and they made it, sorry? Well, well, my standing wasn't an issue because then we brokered a deal. I would have had standing. Uh, we brokered a deal uh, that we would put our federal court process on hold and as long as we got standing at the Quebec Court of Appeal on the government reference, which they agreed. So we went, argued, lost, and now we've appealed it to the Supreme Court. So that'll get heard. But the practical effect of that is that uh, the judge uh, who, was, uh, who they were trying to appoint to the Supreme Court won't make it there because, of course, that spot was uh, appointed. Uh, Suzanne Cote got appointed to that spot. Yeah. So it'll be 20 odd years uh, uh, for, for the issue to arise again. I don't think it'll ever arise again. but. But the issue of whether or not he can be appointed to Quebec court is also a very serious issue. The Constitution says that all Quebec judges have to be appointed from the Quebec bar. And in Nadon, the court decided that doesn't mean former yeah. lawyers. It has to be current. current. And he's not a current lawyer because he's been sitting on this court for six years. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which means nothing to most members of the public. You know, they don't care who gets sits. But it is important in terms of the executive not being able to stack the courts to their liking. So the Nadon reference, for instance, the end result of it was 
seismic in constitutional terms. The Supreme Court actually took the occasion, we were arguing, that their composition cannot be touched without an amendment of all, constitutional amendment with the consent of all 10 provinces. Now that issue would never have come before them if somebody hadn't challenged an appointment, which had never been done. So in winning the NADON reference, the Supreme Court constitutionalized itself from government interference. So it protected itself. Yeah. Well, it protected the system too, because now no government can actually change the composition or rearrange the number of judges or anything without the without the consent of all ten provinces. So you know they can't can't judge stack or you know manipulate the judiciary. The judicial appointment system in Canada is an insidiously, institutionally corrupt white supremacist system, okay? It's gender imbalanced and it's apartheid in its racial composition. End of story. I debate that with anybody, anytime, anywhere, okay? It is sick, okay? Now, past that, the challenges that I've, I've taken are structural, basic rule challenges. You know, the fact, the fact that, you know, you have a complete, a relatively complete absence of non-white, of non non-Quebecois judges on the Superior Court. It's just, it's just appalling. This government has appointed, I think, 120 judges, Superior Court judges, three women, and, and uh, I'm sorry, three racial minorities, and I think 17% women. So the, the rest of them were all white males. I mean, how, how do you justify that in today's Canada? You can't, you can't. It's what I've always called it since the 90s. It's institutional apartheid. And nobody seems to give a shit. I think earlier you spoke one time, you said like, uh, what, what we're going through with Comer right now, how it takes the motion to strike. Like they do that a lot with important cases, just so that it never has to be heard. They do that with it. every important case. Not a, a lot, every one. And sometimes they get the courts to strike, yeah. How is there a way to change that at all? Well, the only way to change that is make appointments to the bench which are on merit, not uh, based on who's a friend to the government in the house. That's how appointments are made now. It's corrupt, politically corrupt. You know, in some countries, you would go to jail for the appointment systems they engage in here. Yeah, it's corruption. In Europe, it's it would be considered political corruption. So it's a matter. Of Kind of political and public world that yeah. kind of get bogged yeah. down begin yeah. dealing with the issues. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're, 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 dealing with, we're dealing with notions and rulings that are really medieval, if Renaissance at best, right? That the appointment of our superior judges are at the sole and unquestionable discretion of the prime minister. Well, how does that accord with the 21st century reality? Yeah, it might have been so in Victorian era where she could have your head cut off just for saying, criticizing her which wasn't a democracy, but how, how do you justify that in a constitutional democracy? Yeah. That he has the sole discretion without regard to gender, race, or merit to appoint anybody he pleases. Well, that's that's just wrong. That's corrupt. It, it's a quiet dictatorship is what it is. Is there a way, I guess only through the House of Commons process, basically, to create statutes that would begin to address... Yeah, I mean, if people, if people made it an issue, then they would have to address it. You know, and uh, one of the things I'm 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 uh, happy with is that uh, these judges challenges that we've taken, the three of them, the deputy judges, Justice Nadon and Justice Mainville, I see a lot of writing now and a lot of uh, writing with academics on this issue, saying it's high time that we have transparency and merit and all of this weigh into the appointment of judges, which wasn't the discourse you heard five years ago. You know, so just got the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we'll go somewhere. I know I, there's a lot of academic interest in it, and then it'll, you know, yeah. and uh, you know. So I think the issue of gender balance in, uh, on the Superior Court Judiciary is something that needs to be taken up. We may very well take that up in the near future. And yeah, I've yet to sit in the coma mm -hmm. in case it's anything to see one female judge. Yeah. Well, uh, Justice Charlotte, she just retired. Justice Dawson is about to retire. There's a few. There's a few uh, on the Court of Appeal, but if you look across the country, it's a real. It's a real, and then race, race is even more repugnant. The absence of racial representation is even more repugnant, especially when you consider there, you can count the number of uh, 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 Native Canadian Superior Court judges on less than one hand across the country. That's, that's insane. That's insane. 
you know? Yeah. Were you starting like a constitutional rights lobby? I started in 2004. It's been going for 10 years. Is We've that, done. Did you uh, do the NADON case under that? Or was that? NADON was the first time the center actually stepped forward as an applicant. And then also in Mainville and the C24 uh, citizenship challenge that just got dismissed last Friday by the trial division. We're appealing that as well. The center was also a co-applicant on that. But we've done over 33 cases quietly. I, for the first 10 years, we wanted to run the, the center on the assumption that we wouldn't get any assistance. So if worst came to worst, we could still run it. Now that that's we've we've done that, we're going to go public and we're going to attempt to fundraise in that in, so that we can we can uh, we can have students working on on cases and more more lawyers and that. But yeah, we've done 33 cases. Nadon was one of them. Yeah. Is it very much pro bono? Yeah. Well, up to now, pro bono in the sense that uh, it's, the, it's the lawyers who are involved who take on, yeah. But we're not going to restrict it to pro bono. If we get hired, we'll, we'll, we'll get paid and the money will go into the slush fund for future cases. That's how we'll work it, you know. Yeah, but, but yeah, it, it was incorporated in 2004. And so after 10 years, we came out of the closet as a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's appealed. Yeah, yeah, the Nadon cost. Oh, we're just, we're just, it'll, it'll take its course. We'll see with this. Uh, it goes to the Court of Appeal. What a slap in the face that was, eh? Unreal. Anyway. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs>